This is Where We Live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalbathanchel. If you're a parent, this won't surprise you. In Connecticut, child care is more expensive than rent, but a new report finds child care in this state is even more expensive than four years at UConn. Coming up, we'll talk with an economist from the National Economic Policy Institute about its findings, and we'll chat with Beth Bai, Connecticut's commissioner at the Office of Early Childhood. What's being done to help lower child care costs for families? And what about bringing up the pay and training for child care workers? We'll find out. That's later. You can join our conversation, 860-275-7266. As always, find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. First, we check in on an employee wellness program that has pitted unionized Yale workers against the university. For more on this story, joining us in studio is Nicole Leonard. She's a health care reporter for Connecticut Public Radio. Nicole, welcome back to the show. Thanks. Good morning. So wellness program, tell us, uh, you know, what, what do we mean by that? Yeah, wellness program is a pretty general term because they all look different. A lot of them look different uh, depending on where you work or what size employer you have. Um, But pretty much at their core, they're designed to help employees or give employees opportunities to better their health or to manage things that are going on in their health, maybe an illness or um, get them to go to those doctors and go get those preventative screenings that are recommended for different age groups like mammograms and colorectal screenings, stuff like that. So, um, you know, really at their core, they're trying to help employees get healthier. When we hear this uh, idea, we think, oh, is this the employer really caring about the health of their employee, or is it about cost? What do we know, Nicole? Right, you know, from studies and from doctors who will talk about, uh, you know, who have researched into this area, it's kind of a bit of both. Um, you know, when we talk about maybe the more altruistic motives of helping people get healthier, they really, um, you know, are not only trying to better physical health, but mental health. They're trying to maybe improve morale or the environment which workers live in. So it can, you know, create some friendly competitiveness and activities and stuff like that that everybody can do together. On the other hand, um, Um, It is uh, proven that um, companies do this because they hope that it'll save them cost saving. It'll turn into cost savings in the long run. So, um, you know, the healthier their employees are, the less they're spending on health care for their employees. And um, there are many research uh, researchers who've looked into this and Healthcare spending is one of the biggest things that an employer will pay out for, um, not even in terms of operations of what they do, but healthcare spending for their employees that is at an all-time high. So they really are trying to, you know, save themselves some money and maybe, um, you know, get some insurance discounts and stuff like that. When we think about employer-sponsored wellness programs, is this something that is a relatively new phenomenon? It's not brand new. You know, it actually goes back. uh, I had a doctor who um, who who's telling me it goes back really to the 1990s. Um, Some wellness programs were cropping up, although it probably weren't in the format that they are that you see today. Um, And then they, you know, gradually more and more companies were joining in the early 2000s. And then really in the last decade, we've seen a big boom of wellness programs, more so at large employers, um, because you do have to put some money out to implement these programs. And a lot of large employers, I think it's about 50 percent or more, have wellness programs. And and it's it's become extremely popular now. But they're not new, um, but they are picking up speed. I understand Kaiser Health News reported that it was the Affordable Care Act that uh, allowed employers to offer financial incentives up to 30 percent of the cost of health insurance uh, with these wellness programs. And that might be another reason why we've seen uh, these numbers grow in the last few years. So when we're talking specifically about this uh, this lawsuit of some Yale workers suing the university, uh, tell us more about the wellness program they were involved in. Because you mentioned earlier these wellness programs vary depending on where you work. All right. So the one at Yale, um, and it's explained on on its website. You can go online and look it up yourself of what's offered to the unionized workers. Um, what it does is it uh, if you participate in the program, you have to um, complete a set of uh, medical and health tests. So a lot of these are preventative screenings like mammograms and maybe a colonoscopy and a vaccine, depending on how many how you know, old you are. Um, So an annual physical, stuff like that. So they need to complete those preventative screenings. um, And then if things crop up in their um, 
health tests or if they do have chronic diseases like diabetes or hypertension, um, they get flagged and they are required to work with a, a medical a health coach um, and to see if that will help maybe um, improve those long-term diseases or those poor medical test outcomes. Um, and, and they're required to do that. Um, like you mentioned, the Affordable Care Act uh, kind of spurred on those financial incentives. Um, this program doesn't offer financial incentives. Um, what it does offer, though, is um, if you do all, if you participate and you meet all these requirements throughout the year, you don't get $25 taken out of your paycheck. Now, if you don't participate, you get $25 taken out of your paycheck every week until you participate or until you complete the program requirements. And so that can be a hit on someone's paycheck. Tell us about the workers in this union. What are the jobs that um, you know they're doing? A lot of these unionized um, workers, they uh, the unions, they're rep- in this specific suit. It's two unions that are uh, being represented, and they they make up about five thousand employees that are um, service workers, uh, maintenance, cafeteria workers. So um, they're doing a lot of physical labor, um, managerial labor. So um, um, so, yeah, so they they and their spouses are beholden to these requirements if they participate or if they get their health insurance coverage through the Yale uh, health insurance plans. So a fee if they don't participate, so yes. not necessarily voluntary. <laughs> right. So it's, it's marketed as voluntary, and uh, federal guidelines actually uh, say that um, if you do request workers for things like blood tests and, and um, you know, pan- health panels and stuff like that, these programs need to be voluntary. Um, and what these workers are saying is that uh, voluntary becomes a little uh, of a gray area because is it really voluntary if you're being financially penalized? No matter how small or large that penalty is, um, is it really voluntary when you're under that threat of a financial penalty? In studio with me is Nicole Leonard. She's healthcare reporter for Connecticut Public Radio. She's been covering this story about a class action lawsuit filed against Yale University by some Yale workers, uh, service workers who uh, don't like this uh, in this idea that they can't if they don't participate in an employer-sponsored wellness program, they actually get a fee up to $100 a month taken out of their paycheck. But it's not just the cost, right? You spoke to someone, uh, one of the employees, Jason Schwartz. What did he tell you? Yeah, uh, some of the employees. It's not the cost. $25 can amount to $1,300 a year. For, so f- for some people, especially living in the New Haven area, um, you know, that could pay for child care. That could be a month's rent. Um, that could be for food, gas, stuff like that. For some people, the cost isn't as much of a, of a blow. And so um, this uh, Jason Swartz is a, a unionized locksmith at Yale. Um, and he said the fin- financial impact is not what's hitting him. What it is, is the sharing of, uh, it has to do with health privacy and the the medical data, and we actually hear from hear from him talk about that. What happens is when your panels don't come back right, or something comes back elevated, your cholesterol is high, whatever. Now you get assigned a health coach. Okay, now you've got another person telling you what you need to do to get healthy, and you know what? That's fine. I don't begrudge the university for wanting a program like this. I don't disagree with the fact that you know people should take an interest in their own health and stuff like that but the bottom line is it's very invasive to have someone else other than you and your doctor involved in whatever medical problem you're experiencing it's traumatic enough right it's really interesting uh, his point i'm curious you know with the uh, uh, privacy of health information you know how does something like this jive with federal regulations involving hipaa for, for instance you know, HIPAA is a big part of it because, um, and for people who don't know, HIPAA really uh, protects their their uh, series of laws that protect your health privacy. People cannot access your medical records without expressly without your consent. And HIPAA goes even as far as if you don't designate a spouse or another person, they don't have access to your medical records. That's really between you and your doctor. So HIPAA is probably one of the most strictest um, laws protecting your health information. And then we have federal laws um, like the um, there's there's federal laws that 
if you ask for certain genetic information or health information, they are also designed to protect your private health information, those blood test results, those chronic conditions. Um, and they really, there's a very small uh, window where someone like an employer or a third party company can ask for that information. And uh, the exception to the rule is that they can ask for it under employee wellness programs. Uh, that are voluntary. Interesting. You spoke to one of the attorneys involved in this class action lawsuit. Who was she? Uh, yeah, Dara Smith is a senior attorney at the AARP Foundation, and they actually have a long history with uh, workplace wellness programs. Um, they sued um, the uh, they sued uh, one of the bodies that um, make sure the wellness programs are being implemented correctly. They create guidelines and uh, they sued them because a couple of years ago they said that it was OK for employers to um, to institute financial penalties for people people who don't participate in wellness programs. And the AARP Foundation uh, fought against that. And so Dara Smith was was part of those efforts. Um, and she's been looking out for cases like the one going on at Yale for, for several years. Um, and I talked to her, and this is actually what she had to say about um, these types of fines and the requirements in workplace wellness programs. The civil rights laws, the ADA and the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, or GINA, um, say that programs like this have to be voluntary. And our argument is that if you are fined for not participating, that's not voluntary. And you have a right to keep that information to yourself. What's also interesting about um, your reporting, Nicole, is that this doesn't just, this applies to a specific uh, type of employee at Yale. Yale University employs a lot of people in the New Haven area. There's even some instances where this idea of an employer-sponsored wellness program, uh, some unions actually negotiated this out of their uh, their workers' contracts. Can you tell us about that? Right. That happened at Yale. So these two unions, they represent a certain amount of employees that do a certain amount of things. Um, and Yale use some. Uh, there's other labor unions that work at Yale. And one of them is the police union. Um, they were going over some tough contract negotiations for the last several years trying to come up with a long-term contract. Um, and they came to a tentative agreement recently. And one of the things that the uh, union representatives were fighting against is a wellness program that had financial fines. They mm -hmm. did not want this type of wellness program for their union police officers. And they did actually negotiate the wellness fine out. So uh, they, uh, the members of that union, are allowed to participate in this wellness program. But if they don't want to participate or they fall out of compliance, meaning they may not complete a test or something like that, uh, they don't get fined. Mm -hmm. um, but they do pay a little bit more and they do contribute a little bit more to their premiums. Um, that was the trade-off. So they don't have to participate, but they need to pay a little bit more toward their premiums where the unions we're talking about who are suing Yale, they are pretty generously covered by the university's wellness plans, almost to 100 percent on on premiums and co-pays. So there is kind of that that trade off. Mm -hmm. Do we know why the Unite Here unions agreed to this while the Yale uh, Police Department union uh, said no way? <laughs> <laughs> that's that's what a lot of union workers are, are trying to find the answers to. They uh, um, they're pretty upset uh, that this is what was agreed to. Uh, and, and, you know, sometimes people say, well, you know, you might have been open to a town hall before or you might have um, been seeing what they were negotiating. And sometimes the reality is you don't know how it's going to impact you until you go through it. And I think that's the situation now where they're finally realizing um, this was put into their contract and this is how it's affecting them. Something you said earlier, but before we had to break that I wanted to circle back on is that uh, because these uh, wellness programs have grown in popularity, uh, there are there have been studies that show that, that getting that uh, the the positive health uh, benefit uh, down the road, possibly lowering costs for physicians, that's not a guarantee or has even been shown in studies. No, it's 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 an interesting interesting thing because wellness programs have grown into an eight billion dollar industry. Um, that's how much they've grown in popularity. Meanwhile, uh, the studies that have looked at them, seeing you know what are the benefits to these um, from both the health and an economic perspective. The studies uh, most recently, actually, one that came out in April. Um, 
that looked at a large that did a large scale clinical trial. Um, they were trying to see if this really lowered health, you know, clinical health risks or uh, lowered the costs on healthcare, and they didn't find that. Um, they might they they. They did find that uh, wellness programs, they do impact behavioral health. So more people who are doing the wellness programs were engaging in exercise or weight management. So that's great. Um, But they didn't find any evidence that the wellness program participants, uh, their, their clinical health issues were changing any because of the wellness program. And it didn't show that um, there were significant cost savings in in health costs. So that's sort of the problem now is that do we need more research? Do we need more long-term research to see if these programs are actually beneficial in those areas? This is where we live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalbethanchel. Nicole Leonard is with me. She's healthcare reporter for Connecticut Public Radio. After the break, we talk with an employment attorney about the prevalence of these employer-sponsored wellness programs. And you can join us too, 860-275-7266, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is where we live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalbethanchel. We're talking about employer-sponsored wellness programs. Do you participate in one at your job? You can join us, 860-275-7266, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. A wellness program offered by Yale University is now the focus of a class action lawsuit. Uh, some workers claiming the program violates federal health, privacy, and discrimination laws. Nicole Leonard is with us. She's healthcare reporter for Connecticut Public Radio who's been covering this story. And joining us now for more perspective is Meredith uh, Diet. Meredith Diet is partner in the Labor and Employment Law Department at law firm uh, Bircham Moses in Milford, Connecticut. Meredith, welcome to our show. Good morning. So uh, we were talking with Nicole about this specific program um, at Yale University. Uh, she mentioned that wellness programs really differ from employer to employer. How prevalent are they in Connecticut? Do we know? So I, I, I think uh, she's right in that, you know, they really are only prevalent in Connecticut with larger employers, but a lot of municipalities in Connecticut have these wellness programs as well. It's interesting, Meredith. I didn't know a lot about these wellness programs. I was chatting with my husband who works for municipal government, and he was telling me, yeah, I do go to a bi- uh, biometrics uh, yearly, and we we right. save on our family plan. I had no idea. <laughs> Right, right. It's it's very prevalent in municipalities. Um, And I think a lot of that is because of that collective bargaining process um, where employees uh, sit at the table with the employer and kind of hammer out the contents of their health care rather than where an employer just gives whatever the health care that they choose to give. So I understand that this lawsuit comes at a time where when you look at uh, just the legal history of what is and isn't permitted in wellness programs, can you get into the broader context of of what we know of how the federal government uh, regulates or gives guidance on these programs? Sure. So the the two main laws uh, from a discrimination standpoint, you know, other than HIPAA and that privacy concept, there's the Americans with Disabilities Act and GINA, which is a federal law that's the Genetic Information Nondisclosure Act. Um, And and those are both laws that apply to any employer in the United States with 15 or more employees. And they prohibit a lot of things uh, that employers can do, including asking candidates and employees for um, personal, private medical information. Uh, You know, and and as an employer, you don't particularly want to know that information because if you make an employment decision... It could be argued that you made it based on the individual's medical information, which is discriminatory. Um, And so both of those laws have provisions that say if an employer has um, a voluntary wellness program, they can ask more information than you would otherwise ask. Um, And a lot of these, a lot of the times these are even done through third parties. But there's still some concern or argument that a third party kind of monitoring and administering a wellness program would would transmit information back to the employer. Mm. And I think as all lawyers do, right, we have to pick a word that could mean a million different things. And there's litigation over what the word voluntary means. 
and when is voluntary really voluntary? Mm. This idea yeah. of the, um, you know, the, the these particular service workers at Yale, if they don't participate, um, getting hit with a twenty-five dollar a week uh, right. uh, fee, uh, so to speak, uh, certainly depending on the job, that does take a, a hit on someone's paycheck, and of course they're going right. to say yes, right? <laughs> right. Well, so and so uh, in two thousand and sixteen, the EEOC, which is the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, and that's kind of the federal agency that is tasked with providing regulations to employers and individuals in the United States on how to navigate these discrimination laws like the ADA and GINA. And they issued what they do. They issued regulations, final regulations. And in those regulations about, in particular, these wellness programs, they basically said, look, um, these programs will be, quote unquote, you know, voluntary as long as the incentive or disincentive, fine, <laughs> is 30% or less than the cost of an individual, in, of the individual insurance. Um, and so that was kind of the regulation that all these employers were starting to build their wellness programs on. And it was to take effect in um, January, in, in 2017, the beginning of 2017. And there was another, there was a lawsuit about that regulation. Uh, I think it was in, in the District of Columbia, in the federal court in the District of Columbia. And the court uh, ruled against uh, the EEOC. They ruled in favor of um, AARP, you know, the Association of Retired Persons. They're the ones who brought that lawsuit. And as a result of that lawsuit, the regulations didn't go into effect. And the EEOC was supposed to kind of go back to the drawing board and reissue regulations. And it seems like the, at the time, it's funny that um, we talk about this now because I'm preparing to do a seminar on all the changes that are taking effect in 2019 in Connecticut and federally in employment law. It was a really busy year. Um, but it seems like the court's real problem with those regulations is that that 30% seems arbitrary. Where'd you come up with that number? So then... As of January of this year, which is why it's relevant to this year, the EEOC says, yeah, we still haven't come up with new regulations. <laughs> um, they were supposed to do it by June of this year, and as we're on this phone call today, that still hasn't happened. And so there are no regulations, and we go back to the world of not knowing what voluntary is with regard to these laws. Mm. That's a lot of uncertainty for employers. Right? right? <laughs> Yeah, so a lot of employers, as I said, had started developing these wellness programs. So now what is an employer to do? Do they just stick with it? Because the court didn't say that's not voluntary. They just said, we need to figure out what voluntary is. Or do they go 10% of the cost, you know, something under 30? Or do they say no fine at all? You know, it, it, it's a really hard question to answer for employers and, and expensive as you guys were talking about before. Uh, Meredith, uh, you know, you are obviously an attorney who represents employers. You know, what are some of your concerns about wellness programs? So my concerns are, are not so much the voluntary aspect. I mean, that has to, that's going to be decided and employers will have to make their policies compliant. Right. My concern always as an employment attorney representing employers is I really want my clients to know as little medical information about their employees as possible because any decision that an employer makes, let's, you know, the most obvious decision is to terminate, right? Mm -hmm. If I have knowledge as an employer of your medical information, which might be a disability, um, and I decide to terminate you, there is at least an argument that I'm going to have to potentially defend that I made that decision because of your disability. I wouldn't have otherwise terminated you if I didn't, if you didn't have cancer, mm. right? And it's very hard for an employer to prove that they didn't have knowledge of the medical information, um, if, if there's this well, you know, these programs where all that medical information is out there in the, 
cloud somewhere will have to prove a chain of custody that we didn't know that information. And I'm not really sure how likely juries are to believe that that those arguments. We're talking about employer-sponsored wellness programs uh, today here on Where We Live. On the phone, uh, Meredith Diet, partner in the Labor and Employment Law Department at law firm Bertram Moses in Milford, Connecticut. Also, Nicole Leonard in studio with me, healthcare reporter for WMPR. If you participate in a um, uh, wellness program at your place of work, we'd love to hear from you, 860-275-7266. Uh, Meredith, we actually heard from a physician in Waterbury. He wasn't able to keep holding, uh, but he said as a physician, he doesn't necessarily feel comfortable comfortable filling out forms for wellness programs. He feels it could be a, a violation of patients' privacy. Um, again, this is something that Nicole had raised earlier with some of the people that she's interviewed at, at Yale right. who don't want to be um, then talking with this third-party health coach about their um, health issues. Right. Well, you know, the, the thing is, that goes back to that word voluntary, because if I don't participate, I'm going to get the fine, right, under that Yale program. I haven't looked at the Yale program. But HIPAA is not violated if I voluntarily waive my HIPAA rights. Mm -hmm. So as typically as part of participating in these programs, you're signing a waiver that your health information can be shared. So every single one of these roads is going to bring us right back to that word voluntary. And at what point is it really voluntary? Or as Nicole said, um, you're, you're kind of beholden to it. You're coerced. And I, I agree with you. There is an argument that $25 a week adds up and is a lot of money. Um, I, I, I just don't know what that threshold is. At what point is it not a lot of money? Um, some companies don't have a fine if you don't participate. Instead, they give you an incentive. Um, but I think there's an argument there, too. At what point am I able to walk away from that incentive? Right? Right. Uh, you can join our conversation, 860-275-7266, or find us on Facebook and uh, Twitter, uh, at Where We Live. Um, so looking specifically at this uh, Yale class action lawsuit, I mean, how do you think it'll impact, you know, broadly the question of the legality of how they're incentivized, which you just discussed? So the lawsuit in Yale, first of all, because it's a class action, that's pretty significant. Um, you know, the EEOC will pay attention because it's a class action. Um now, it's very, I, from what I understand, it's in the very early stages. Just because they filed it as a class action doesn't mean it will get class action status. And, and that in and of itself is kind of uh, a hurdle to get over. Um, it, it, you know, the EEOC, just like any other government organization, is very busy. And they have a lot of things they have to do. And they were supposed to, as I explained, um, issue new updated regulations with regard to this question in June. Um, it's July 29th, and as I was preparing for that other presentation that I told you I'm about to give, I looked at their website, and there's no indication <clears throat> as to when they may issue these updated regulations. Um, and so I, I think the question becomes whether the EEOC wants to create their own regulations or let the court decide what voluntary is. Mm. Um, you know, there are, I'm sure, I, I didn't look, but I'm sure there's other similar lawsuits sprouting up throughout the country now that that regulation um, was rescinded in January of this year. Mm. Uh, and so you're going to start having splits among courts as to what voluntary means. And mm. as any employer can tell you, that's always challenging um, because, you, you know, it's hard to follow the law if there's no specific status of what the law is. So it could it could trickle down and maybe the EEOC rushes and finishes to get that regulation out, or, or maybe they wait and see what the court says. Um, it, it, it's a really, really interesting question, because yeah. uh, generally speaking, employment laws pretty much stay consistent um, on the federal level. So this is a big change on the federal level that opens things up again. Let's take some calls now here on Where We Live. Uh, the number 860-275-7266 or find us on Facebook and uh, Twitter at Where We Live. Uh, Mary's calling from Hartford. Mary, go ahead. 
Hi. i just like to point out that this discussion is about the lawyerly issues about data collection and, and instead of what do we need to do to design a wellness program for health care, health development for, for wellness? Uh, are they yoga? Is it, um, nutritional advice? Why, who is, who is getting to design these wellness programs so that they're inserting, um, data collection as a priority instead of the kind of, um, guidance and care that will actually improve um, our healthcare system, because what we're seeing is so much emphasis on data, on medicine, on instead of just the things that we know make us healthy, like good nutrition, exercise, and building those into a wellness plan. Who's designing these wellness plans rather than who's litigating them? Uh, good point, so, Mary. Uh, we, we talked to Nicole Leonard earlier about just the efficacy of these wellness plans and why employers even offer them. Uh, Nicole? Yeah, I think the problem is now is that, um, like Mary pointed out, what, you know, designing healthcare programs that actually prove that have proven things to make people happier, to help people um, manage their health. Uh, And when I talked to researchers about this, they really did say, you know, there is no prototype. There is no wellness prototype right now that says, hey, this is the prototype. If you're an employer who wants to implement this, these are the um, components of a wellness program that um, have shown to be effective. There's nothing like that right now. And I think that is, it does trace back to that lack of um, study and research saying, you know, if a wellness program has these things, uh, you will get short term and long term um uh, effects in cost savings and in health benefits. So we're not, it doesn't sound like we're not there yet. Natalie's calling from Rocky Hill. Natalie, go ahead. Hi, um, I participate in an employee wellness program and I thought this was really interesting because I never considered any of the legal implications of somebody who isn't healthy because I myself am healthy. Um, and I, this has been an eye opening thing to listen to and I'm really interested in what comes up next. I think they're important to have because there was a time when healthcare was something that you could only get from an employer. If I'm, I don't, I'm not old enough to know when that time was, but I do know that it does exist. And now wellness is being offered, and you know programs are discounted for somebody to live a healthy lifestyle. And I think that's okay, but it's not okay if somebody can't or needs more counseling. Mm-hmm. So, or if it determines whether they get to work or not. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. And are you are you concerned about the the issues of discrimination, the gray area there of, of who has of that information? Yeah, of course. I work with people who I, I'm a physical therapist, so I work with people who have disabilities or can't work because of disabilities. And you know, I I want everyone to be able to work and live a full lifestyle and to fulfill out their own needs um, without being discriminated against. Well, Natalie, thank you uh, for uh, your uh, call here on Where We Live. Uh, Nicole? And to Natalie's point, actually, when she said, um, you know, that this is really uh, enlightening her and, and, you know, just uh, going into a topic that, um, you know, to the point where she said she's healthy and that's great. And you might not think twice about or, or might think a little bit less about participating in a wellness program if, say, you are healthy or maybe you're younger and therefore you are less at risk of already having a chronic disease or something like that. You're probably not beholden to a lot of um, those preventative screenings yet because you're younger or you might not have to go through some of the more stringent requirements um, that require you to work with a health coach or something like that. Um, And so I think uh, when we're talking about the Yale lawsuit, it is based in sort of this discrimination area because an AARP is involved because older uh, participants are more at risk of suffering uh, the fines or, you know, having to complete a lot of things to comply with this program. So that's sort of where the discrimination comes in, uh, where older adults or older workers may, um, you know, struggle a bit more uh, with these types of programs. Nicole Leonard, again, is healthcare reporter for Connecticut Public Radio. Uh, Nicole, thanks for joining us today uh, to talk about the specific lawsuit and overall these employer-sponsored uh, wellness programs that are a big $8 billion industry. Yes, thanks for having me. Also with us was Meredith uh, Diet, partner in the Labor and Employment Law Department at law firm Bertram Moses & Milford. Meredith, thanks for calling in. We appreciate it. 
Thank you very much. This is Where We Live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Coming up, we're going to shift to talking about one of the big, biggest expenses families face today. How do you afford health child care? Does it impact your ability to work? You can join our conversation, 860-275-7266, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is where we live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Coming up tomorrow, for some Americans, the path to adoption can be winding and difficult. On the next Where We Live, we take an in-depth look at the realities of adopting a child, and we want to hear from you. That's tomorrow. Now, the start of school is just about a month away, and for working families, that return to school also helps alleviate the cost of child care, which adds up in the summer. Now, how do you manage care for your child or children so you can work? You can join us, 860-275-7266, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. Child care is one of the biggest expenses for families. A new report looks at just how much it costs across the country. Elise Gould is joining us. She's senior economist at the Economic Policy Institute, or EPI. This is a nonpartisan nonprofit think tank in Washington, D.C. Elise, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. So tell us, um, we're here in Connecticut. We know there's a lot here that's expensive, but how does child care look specifically in our state and nationwide? Well, child care is expensive across the country. In Connecticut, um, it is particularly more expensive. It ranks about fifth out of 50 states in D.C. for the most expensive infant care in the country. So a lot of families are struggling across the country and particularly in Connecticut. Well, what do we know about, you know, oftentimes we think about affordability, you know, how much someone should pay for their mortgage or rent, uh, the cost of housing. But when we look at a family's, uh, you know, their savings and how much they bring in each month, you know, how much of that should be allotted for child care and how much is actually the reality? Well, the United States Health and Human Services Department um, recommends that child care should cost no more than 7% of a family's income. So then you think about the income you have left over for things, as you said, like housing and, and, um, and health care and food, all the other things, transportation, right, car payments, everything else that they need. But unfortunately, many people in Connecticut simply cannot meet that standard. So if you look at a median family with young children, those families that are most likely to need that care, that expensive care, um, their median income is about $85,000 a year. Those families with young children, that's median income. So the middle family, basically, the typical family in Connecticut. And so therefore, they would have to spend nearly one-fifth that's much higher than the 7% recommended standard, one-fifth of their income every year on child care. And so what are the repercussions? Are we seeing that forces you know, one parent to delay going back to work or not working at all? Yes, absolutely. I mean, there are repercussions um, on two different levels. One is, well, you have to work, right? Because we know that um, in general, we've seen that two parents have to work to be able to make ends meet, to pay for all the other expenses. As I said, like housing and transportation and health care and food, all those other things that they need to pay. Maybe even debt service. Maybe We know there's a lot of college debt out there, right? So families are struggling to pay for all of those things. They need to have two incomes to do that, and therefore they need child care. And then some families who simply can't afford that child care, they force one parent, often the mother, to stay home. And then they're out of the labor force, and that uh, weakens their labor force position once the kids do go on to school. In studio uh, with me is Beth Bai. She's commissioner for the Connecticut Office of Early Childhood. Uh, Beth, welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Josie. Uh, we wanted to hear from you because we know that there are child care programs, uh, subsidies that help uh, particular families who are below a certain income level. And we're just wondering, you know, what is the state of, of child care in Connecticut today? Are there enough uh, spaces for families? Well, uh, thanks for that question. I think uh, child care is very expensive. It's really hard on families, and that has an impact on children. And it affects all families in Connecticut. Uh, we know that um, four out of five families in Connecticut cannot afford the cost of infant care. Um, and we have a supply problem as well. So in a natural economy, that would drive up the costs even more. Um, but there's this cap that you almost just talked about mm-hmm. um, with with the expert. I can't remember her first name. Elise. Elise. Um, so that um, 
parents can only pay so much to have it be worth them being in the labor force. So in Connecticut, we are short 51,000 infant toddler spaces for parents who need to be at work. And in Connecticut, 71% of families um, have all parents in the workforce. So we have a, a real challenge that is, uh, impacts child safety, but also really impacts our workforce. Because when parents don't have reliable child care, uh, they're not reliable employees. And um, this is a time when states are competing to attract and keep the best workforce. And it's been a big focus of Governor Lamont. And so child care is something we're focused on and trying to improve access to in Connecticut. In recent years, uh, Beth, uh, there has been a tension on, I think it's called care for kids uh, and the uh, amount of families that are able to participate because of, of state uh, funding issues. Uh, that threshold has been lowered even more. And so how many more families are we talking about that may not have another option because of this uh, change? Yes, many, many families uh, do not have options. Um, since January, we've been working hard to increase access to child care for those families that qualify uh, qualify for care for kids. If you make less than 50% of the state median income, you get some support for child care. So that's about $44,000 for a family of four. Um, we were supporting 14,000 children in January. Now we are supporting 18,000 children because we've been able to keep the program open and manage uh, the list of families waiting. Um, also, uh, Congresswoman DeLauro was able to get more federal dollars across the country, but it brought about $15 million more dollars to Connecticut a year this year and next year. And that gave us a comfort to open the program to have more families access and has increased the supply of child care in Connecticut. And last week, we announced enhanced rates. It had been 17 years since infant toddler rates had gone up, um, and they went up significantly. It starts September 1st to try to, again, address this situation where there's not enough high-quality care for children uh, who are very young and when their brains are most vulnerable. Uh, through the Economic Policy Institute report, you know, infant care costing uh, $3,100 of 25% uh, more per year than in-state tuition for a four-year uh, public college. So when we think about the Care for Kids program, you know, how much does that cover per month? Yes, it depends on the family. There's really a sliding scale depending on how much uh, the family makes. And, and I'm glad you raised that piece about the public college because, indeed, it is more expensive than college. And, and the brain at that time has more opportunity and more room to be damaged permanently. So it's very important. But when you break it down by hour, child infant toddler care in Connecticut costs about $6 an hour. Um, and when I did the hours of contact at UConn, uh, that costs about $27 an hour because daycares are open 10 hours a day, 50 weeks a year, mm -hmm. and the ratio is four to one. So they also have seven times the labor demand because college classes are much bigger. So it's more expensive, but the actual mm -hmm. payment is, is way lower per hour. Uh, so we have a real issue um, in our culture right now with child care and workforce in our state and in our country. Elise Gould is with us, who's senior economist at the Economic Policy Institute. Uh, so what are some of the recommendations? Because if you talk to uh, any parent who's paying for one or more children to go to a daycare center or any type of child care so they can work, I mean, the costs are high, but it's not like, not like those uh, costs really trickle down to the child care worker, uh, Elise. So I'm just wondering what some of the solutions might be to help uh, with the cost, but also making sure that that child care um, is of quality. Yes, of course. And Beth makes great points there about how the cost per hour are actually not nearly as high as college, except the development is so important for kids that age, we should be making those investments. So in some way, that care is actually being um, paid for on the backs of low wages, in many cases, for those very important early educators. And parents want to send their kids to high-quality care. They're often waiting lists, even for parents who can't afford it. And so you need to be able to increase the supply of that high-quality care, and that means you need to pay for it. Right? So you need to be able to pay, you need to be willing to pay um, education and training, pay their wages, make sure their compensation is and working conditions are, are high quality for those workers to be able to provide the best care possible for those kids. And so that means more investments. And it sounds like what Connecticut is doing is definitely moving in the right direction, making it more affordable for more families, also investing more in the professional development of, those, of that workforce. To be able to meet that increased demand, you actually have to do more and, and pay more and make sure you have a pipeline of those early educators in the system. Mm. 
Uh, tell us about some of the gaps. Uh, Beth Bai, who's commissioner for the Connecticut Office of Early Childhood, when we look at the workforce, uh, again, they're not getting paid very much, but there's also been some movement to um, help them get early childhood certificates because you mentioned, you know, it's very formative years from zero to five. Uh, it's not just making sure that somebody is watching a child, but they're helping them develop through these years. Yes, and in, in, in our state and in our country, it is the lowest paid profession um, here. Mm-hmm. And so we have to challenges with our workforce. And we've been making important investments in scholarships uh, so people can go back to school with support. Um, We also are trying to deal with an issue uh, that is some child care deserts in Connecticut where centers are not opening because there's not the funding to pay uh, to keep a center open. And so uh, there's an organization called All Our Kin in Connecticut uh, that, that basically supports family child care providers with coaching and professional development, and we've expanded that. We have seven funded family child care networks that we're studying to see if we can both increase the supply in places uh, where it's lowest supply, Stanford, New Haven, Bridgeport are three examples of child care deserts, um, and so build small local businesses and support people um, who are trying to provide child care for infants and toddlers in their homes in a way that is licensed and, and regulated and supported um, by our office uh, to expand supply. There have been some high-profile uh, stories of children uh, that have died in, in home daycare facilities. And so how do you, I guess, uh, reconcile a parent's uh, concern about, you know, if not a daycare center that might be of a name that they're used to, like Bright Horizons or Apple Daycare, versus mm-hmm. uh, trusting somebody in a neighborhood uh, to care for their child? Right. I think it's it's multidimensional, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, we know that young children's brains are very vulnerable and that they are. it's important that they have that close attachment uh, with a provider. Um, And those high-profile cases have uh, been in unregulated child care, which you have to know that if there are 51,000 spaces, if we are 51,000 spaces short as a state, that parents need to find child care to work, to put food on the table, to keep a roof over their heads. So Um, What we're doing is we have a whole campaign about trust licensed care to get the message out to parents that they should look for licensed care and accredited care um, because our licensed family child care providers are amazing and they are really building young brains and supporting their development. And we've been able to um, also move the Care for Kids wages there up Mm -hmm. as well. And now with organizations that are supporting them professionally, coming in and coaching where they have a backup if they need a sub, I think we're seeing improvements in the quality and access uh, with that approach. Mm. Uh, Any um, movement on how uh, your office or other stakeholders in the state work with school districts to provide uh, universal uh, preschool or pre-K? Because depending on where you live, it's very piecemeal. Uh, There might be uh, one uh, program and then you have to apply to a lottery. It leaves a lot of families out who still want that quality care. Absolutely. I'm so glad you raised that, Lucy, because schools are really the biggest child care providers in our country. Many of us, I know I was as a parent, just hanging on till kindergarten because it was so hard to afford child care as a family and afford a home and everything else because of the high costs. Um, so um, more districts are doing this. Some of them are, are adding preschool as a way to attract young families to town. Um, so we are seeing an expansion in preschool in the public schools. And we work closely with them with school readiness funds and smart start funds uh, to try to encourage that. Um, So I think that's a really important part of the system that we can't forget about. So uh, we're looking for universal access right now because of capacity issues. It's a public-private system in Connecticut, and we're working to improve the quality in all settings. Mm. I wanted to go back to Elise Gould, senior economist at the Economic Policy Institute. We just have under a minute, Elise, but, you know, any um, hope that the federal government could provide, you know, more incentives or initiatives to help states, or is this really a local issue? Oh, definitely. I mean, I think at this point the states have to act um, in in lieu of larger scale reform. But you do see some measures being introduced at the national level to both make sure that you deal with the affordability issue and the quality issue as well. So that is making sure that parents can afford and have high quality options for their kids and make sure that those high quality options are there means you have to pay for it. And so making sure that you have enough money in the system to be able to pay those teachers well 
and not only you know pay them well and make sure they're in their classroom, make sure they have yeah. the time for professional development and uh, non-contact time. So and they we'll, can and we'll have to lessons. leave it. We'll have to leave it there. Elise Gould, thank you for joining us. Also, Beth By, Commissioner for the Thanks Connecticut so Office of Early Childhood. This is where we live.